There's one terrible pilot. How was the war on terror one? America was targeted for attack. We're investigating right in this act of war. We want to we want these attacks on our freedom. One terrible pilot. Hello, I'm Barry Zwicker, journalist and media critic. Welcome to The Great Conspiracy, the 9-11 news special you never saw. On this program, we ask questions the 9-11 Commission and the media never asked. We introduce experts you've never seen before and provide background you never get. We recommend books, magazines, videos, and DVDs you've probably never heard of and websites the media keep under wraps. We avoid thought stoppers such as anti-American and conspiracy theorists and that new word believed to be linked to Al-Qaeda. U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt declared, the greatest thing we have to fear is fear itself. And indeed, fear may well be the greatest single human motivator. It can serve us and it can save us, but ill-founded fear, that's another story. For instance, before we commit to a war based on a threat we're told to fear, before we commit our children's blood and billions of dollars to that war, we'd better be sure the threat is real, that a clear and present danger exists, because war itself is to be feared. U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt fought fear. Today's leaders traffic in it, chiefly the fear of terrorism. That's it. Not global warming, not the end of oil, not domestic and worldwide injustice, not rampant militarism, not war itself, or even war without end. Just terrorism. The words are hypnotically repeated. Terrorism, terrorist, terrorist threat, and of course, believed to be linked to Al-Qaeda. These words appear in millions of newspaper and magazine headlines and are embedded by the billions in stories. But it's the so-called war on terrorism that's in our faces practically 24-7 as the inescapable focus of our existence and the justification for great sacrifice. One day, our grandchildren will look back on this time and ask, how was the war on terror won? And we will tell them about the brave men and women who gave their lives so that we could live in freedom. Some would have it that our support for this new quasi-religion, the so-called war on terrorism, is the measure of our commitment to country and civilization. This program explores interwoven fictions that make up the fabric of the so-called war on terrorism. It explores the promiscuous issuing of terror alerts. It explores the biggest secret and dirtiest deception of all, bloody terrorist events carried out not by foreign but by our governments to trick the public into supporting war and police state agendas. We explore in particular the radioactive core of today's terrorist hysteria, namely the official story of 9-11, the overarching fiction and crime and cover-up of our time. Before you see this program, or after you do, there may well be another state-sponsored dirty deception. If there is, and if the information in this program helps you to see it for what it is, it will have been worthwhile. The sacred text at the heart of the so-called war on terrorism is the official narrative of what happened on September 11, 2001. Namely, that the whole of U.S. intelligence, civil aviation, military, and the political apparatus is caught completely off guard by one evil man and his small network of co-conspirators. America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world. And no one will keep that light from shining. That provides ready-made, easy-to-hate villains and their motives. They hate our freedoms, George Bush repeats over and over. But the official story just doesn't make sense, as we will show. It's exploited as planned by its creators, the government. But final responsibility for the unbelievable story living on to the extent it does in the public mind lies with the vast majority of my colleagues in the mainstream media. 
If they ever start to do their job properly and examine it skeptically, the official story will crumble into dust finer than that of the Twin Towers. Now, absolutely no one disagrees that 9-11 was a conspiracy. Conspiracy is at the heart of the official story, after all. A conspiracy perpetrated, allegedly, by Osama bin Laden. But what if the conspiracy were hatched not in a cave in Afghanistan, but in Washington, D.C., at the highest levels of the U.S. government? What if the public found out the official story is a big lie? How might that change plans for endless war? There are other paths to true security and lasting peace. The first step on those paths is to expose the official 9-11 story for what it is, a contrived fiction, and then to demand a true accounting of what happened on 9-11 and who was behind the events of that day. Terrorism has been with us for a long time. It tends to be the last resort of the powerless, suffering under acute injustice. And as such, one person's terrorist is seen by another as a freedom fighter. This is what Noam Chomsky calls retail terrorism, that carried out by angry or paid individuals. But then there's wholesale terrorism, that carried out by states. Robert Jensen writes in the Houston Chronicle, For more than five decades throughout the Third World, the United States has deliberately targeted civilians or engaged in violence so indiscriminate that there is no other way to understand it except as terrorism and it has supported similar acts of terrorism by client states. He could have reached back further. In his new book, The American Empire and the Fourth World, Anthony J. Hall, according to one reviewer, connects the unspeakable crimes visited upon indigenous people since the conquest by Columbus in 1492 to today's so-called war on terror. According to Hall himself, the imagery of terrorism has replaced that of savagery and then communism as the main explanatory catch-all to describe the real, illusory, or manufactured enemies of the American way of life. So, on one side, ours, the use of terror either is not admitted or is simply defined as not terror. And the other side's terror is defined as the only kind of terror. Terror then needs to be put into perspective. Perspective, writes Lawrence Martin, former Washington correspondent for the Globe and Mail, is a ghost in American journalism. Last year, acts of terrorism killed 300 to 400 people, ranking it so far down the list of dangers that it is barely visible. He might have added that 300 is the number of Americans struck by lightning each year. Another note about appearance and reality. The vast majority of people arrested as terrorism suspects are released without charges being laid. It's the arrest stories with those Arab names and pictures that remain in the public mind as reality. Isn't there a pattern of state-sponsored, media-abetted deception here? But the dirtiest secret about terrorism is also by far the largest. Many spectacular acts of terrorism are fearsome fakeries carried out by cabals within governments, and I mean our own governments, the gold standard is the attack on one's own country to mobilize public opinion for power, political gain, and profit. The Nazis masterminded the torching of the Reichstag, the German parliament buildings, on February the 27th, 1933, one week before a national election. That they did so is historical fact. Portrayed best in William L. Shirer's masterpiece, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, Within hours, Hitler and his henchmen designate the communists as the villains and label them terrorists. The government promises proof, but never provides it. The communists did not do it. A single communist was the patsy. The big lie of who torched the Reichstag is used by Hitler to sow fear. He bullies the German president to sign a decree suspending seven main articles of the German constitution. The claim is that the fatherland, think homeland, is under threat. Ensuing arrests and murders of communists and socialists terrorize anti-Hitler dissent. In the ensuing election, Hitler does not get the majority he needs to rule. But soon after, he essentially seizes power. 
He then is free to launch preemptive strikes against other countries and wage a world war sold as patriotic. The ultimate result for Germans is calamitous. 600,000 civilians dead, 7.5 million homeless, their country broke and in ruins. The Reichstag fire was a major turning point. Within hours of the planes crashing into the World Trade Center, the Bush White House designates the alleged villains. Within 30 days, the U.S. Constitution and the civil liberties of Americans are weakened by near-unanimous passage of the Patriot Act. A war on terror is announced. Within months, preemptive strikes are launched against Afghanistan and Iraq, though no evidence is produced that Iraq took part in 9-11. Dissent in the USA is under fire even as millions in the USA and worldwide oppose the Iraq War. The White House announces that the war on terror, in effect world war, may never end. At least a thousand Americans are soon to die in Iraq alone. Expenditures mount into the trillions. The so-called war on terrorism justifies the mounting deaths of U.S. soldiers and civilians in Iraq and elsewhere, justifies the little publicized construction of giant new U.S. military bases overseas, and is the basis for the doctrine of preemptive war, contrary to international law and basic morality. It's responsible for grotesquely ballooning deficits to pay for all this, debts being passed on to coming generations, and plans for even more expenditures on terror-fighting bureaucracies. The so-called war on terror is cited as the ultimate basis for sharp increases in domestic spying and reduction in freedoms and civil liberties at home and attempts to criminalize dissent. All this because the official authorized truth is that foreign terrorists attacked the USA on 9-11. As we tape this in the summer of 2004, fear grows as authorities and pundits predict more terrorist events. On the scale of 9-11, or greater. The I word, inevitable, is increasingly used. The designated scapegoats of 9-11 gained nothing positive from it. On the other hand, even the hardliners in Washington themselves agree 9-11 boosted their agenda. Who benefits from more of the same? The fear campaign, always resting on the official 9-11 story, looks deliberate. Again, what if the official story of 9-11 is a big lie? You probably don't know, if you're trapped inside the cocoon spun by the North American media industry, that there is in fact widespread skepticism about who was behind 9-11. 30% of Germans, according to reliable polls, think the U.S. government had a hand in it. They remember that big Reichstag deception. This poll done in Canada in May 2004 showed 63% of Canadians think individuals within the U.S. government, including the White House, had prior knowledge of the plans for the events of September 11th and failed to take appropriate action to stop them. In this program, we present some of the accumulating evidence indicating that lying behind the great deception of 9-11 is the great conspiracy of 9-11. But first, more historical context. When we come back, three true stories of fake attacks on America. Let's find out about despotism. This man makes it his job to study these things. Well, for one thing, avoid the comfortable idea that the mere form of government can of itself safeguard a nation against despotism. Welcome back to The Great Conspiracy. The 9-11 news special you never saw. If 9-11 is a big lie, a fake attack, an inside job, is it unique? No, quite the reverse. Most war-triggering incidents are great deceptions. The Mexican-American War, the Spanish-American War, the attack on Pearl Harbor, all involved secretly contrived attacks on Americans planned or encouraged by American presidents. The Vietnam War and Desert Storm in 1991 also were triggered by deceptions involving U.S. presidents. If 9-11 is not such a deception, it's an exception to the rule. Most people want peace most of the time. That's a problem for rulers bent on war. 
History teaches that rulers arranging for their country to be attacked, or appear to be attacked, is the fastest method for these rulers to get their way when they want war. Consider only three cases, starting with this book, Body of Secrets. Author James Bamford is a former Washington investigative producer for ABC's World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. I learned of this book on ABC's website. Bamford's information comes from interviews with, for instance, the former dean of the U.S. intelligence community and from government documents. It takes 80 pages to list Bamford's more than 600 information sources. Here's the story. It's 1962. John F. Kennedy is U.S. President, Robert McNamara is Secretary of Defense, and Admiral Lyman Lemnitzer heads the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. The CIA fails in its illegal Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba. JFK decides, Bamford writes, to back away from military solutions to the Cuban problem. But Lemnitzer, the CIA, and others at the top remain obsessed with Cuba. Writes Bamford, as the Kennedy brothers appeared to suddenly go soft on Cuba, Lemnitzer could see his opportunity to invade quickly slipping away. Attempts to provoke the Cuban public to revolt seemed dead. Lemnitzer and the other chiefs knew there was only one option left that would ensure their war. They would have to trick the American public and world opinion. Lemnitzer comes up with Operation Northwoods. We could blow up a U.S. ship in Guantanamo Bay and blame Cuba. Casualty lists in U.S. newspapers would cause a helpful wave of national indignation. We could develop a communist Cuban terror campaign in the Miami area, in other Florida cities, and even in Washington. An elaborate variation. Create an exact duplicate for a civil registered aircraft. At a designated time, the duplicate would be loaded with selected passengers, all boarded under carefully prepared aliases. The actual registered aircraft would be converted to a drone, a remotely controlled unmanned aircraft. The destruction of that aircraft will be triggered by radio signal. The Cubans would be blamed. Finally, another variation is described by Bamford. On February the 20th, 1962, John Glenn was to lift off from Cape Canaveral on his historic journey. Lemnitzer proposed that should the rocket explode and kill Glenn, the objective is to provide irrevocable proof that the fault lies with Cuba by manufacturing various pieces of evidence which would prove electronic interference on the part of the Cubans. Thus, Bamford notes, as NASA prepared to send the first American into space, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were preparing to use John Glenn's possible death as a pretext to launch a war. The Operation Northwoods plan shows the Pentagon was capable, according to Bamford, of launching a secret and bloody war of terrorism against their own country in order to trick the American public into supporting a war on Cuba. In light of this, does Pentagon complicity in the events of September 11th sound entirely far-fetched? Now, fast forward just two years from Operation Northwoods to August 2nd, 1964. In the Gulf of Tonkin, North Vietnamese torpedo boats attack the U.S. destroyer Maddox. The Associated Press story, for some reason, is Dateline Pearl Harbor. The lead. Three PT boats, identified by Secretary of State Dean Rusk as North Vietnamese, attacked. Later, a second U.S. destroyer is attacked, according to news reports. Although no U.S. sailor suffers a scratch, the American public is outraged. President Lyndon Johnson goes on television to ask the country to support war action. Two days later, the Tonkin Gulf Resolution is approved by the U.S. House of Representatives unanimously, then by the Senate, 88 to 2. The resolution becomes the entire justification for the United States' war against Vietnam. Before that's over, 58,000 American soldiers and 3 million Vietnamese die. One small problem. There never were any North Vietnamese PT boats. The events never happened. As Secretary of State Rusk, the President, and Defense Secretary Robert McNamara well know. They know because they plan the entire deception. One source for this is former Admiral James Stockdale in his book, In Love and War. 
On the night in question, Stockdale is at the controls of a fighter jet flying cover for the two destroyers. He sees nothing. Another source is Ben Bradley, much respected former managing editor of the Washington Post. Bradley, in a public lecture in England in April 1987, states, the facts behind this critically important resolution were quite simply lies. Fast forward again to August 2nd, 1990. Iraq attacks Kuwait, claiming the Kuwaitis are slant drilling into Iraq's oil fields. U.S. President George Herbert Walker Bush pushes for a land war so against Iraq. But polls show the U.S. public is split 50-50 on that idea. Then comes this eyewitness testimony before a congressional committee from a 15-year-old Kuwaiti girl. The claim is she cannot be identified for fear of reprisals. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. The U.S. public is outraged. The result? Support for land war zooms. It's a turning point. Desert Storm is launched. 135,000 Iraqis are killed. An estimated 1 million Iraqis, many of them children and old people, then die as a result of 10 years of sanctions. One small problem. There never were any incubator baby deaths. Not one. The Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's investigative flagship program, The Fifth Estate, reveals the girl to be the Kuwaiti ambassador's daughter, given her lines and coached in acting by the giant American PR firm Hill & Knowlton. It's one phase in a $10 million joint U.S.-Kuwaiti campaign of deception. This man is lying. I myself buried 14 newborn babies that had been taken from their incubators. This man is lying. And they had kids in incubators, and they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. There were a lot of people who participated in a conspiracy, yes, an out-and-out -out conspiracy, of fake organizations, false documents, fraud, and disinformation. So, if a new man named Bush is in the White House, and helps engineer a brazen deception in order to achieve global geopolitical goals as well as domestic and personal ones, it wouldn't be a first, would it? After a short break, a detailed look at the events of September 11, 2001. Today, democracy can ebb away in communities whose citizens allow power to become concentrated in the hands of bosses. What I say goes, see? I'm the law around here. <laughs> the test of despotic power is that it can disregard the will of the people. Welcome back to The Great Conspiracy, the 9-11 news special you never saw. The events of 9-11 begin with aircraft going wildly off course. Incredibly, Despite radar tracking for almost two hours, the whole of the mighty U.S. Air Force goes AWOL that morning. It's a mind-bending anomaly. Not a single U.S. Air Force interceptor turns a wheel until it's too late. There are no jets at all. It's a matter of historical record. That could happen only two ways. Either it was staggering multiple simultaneous coincidental incompetence at all levels in many agencies defying known laws of averages, a 54 million to one chance, which is the 9-11 Commission official story. There's another explanation. The U.S. Air Force is neutralized by design. The evidence indicates this is about a one to one chance. Standard procedures for dealing with aviation emergencies of all kinds have been in place and have worked for years. David Ray Griffin is the author of The New Pearl Harbor, the most widely respected critique of the official story of 9-11. He quotes the Federal Aviation Authority's Aeronautical Information Manual, Official Guide to Basic Flight Information and Air Traffic Control, ATC, procedures. It states, if you are in doubt that a situation constitutes an emergency or potential emergency, handle it 
as though it were an emergency. As for the military, the guiding document is ACC 113-SAOC, Volume 3, U.S. Air Defense Command and Control Operations. At the top of the first page, it reads, Compliance with this order is mandatory. The first paragraph reads, in part, The ADC, Air Defense Command, is to provide North American Aerospace Defense Command with the means to detect, monitor, identify, intercept, report, and if necessary, destroy any airborne object that may pose a threat to North America in the fulfillment of the Tactical Threat Warning Attack Assessment and to provide such information to collateral missions of NORAD. Michael Rupert, a former Los Angeles Police Department detective, was the first major 9-11 skeptic and researcher in the world and remains one of the foremost. He was one of 40 experts on 9-11 who testified at the six-day International Citizens' Inquiry into 9-11, held in Toronto in May of 2004. I helped organize that event. At the inquiry, Michael Rupert addresses the absence of jet interceptors, but the unlikelihood of a simple stand-down order, and asks, What if they were so confused and had been so deliberately confused that they couldn't respond? Michael Rupert is standing by at his office in Sherman Oaks, California. Michael, thanks for this. What is the reason for the failure of U.S. military jets to show up in a timely fashion on 9-11? Well, the simple fact is, Barry, that they didn't know where to go. The reason that they didn't know where to go was because a number of conflicting and overlapping uh, war game exercises were taking place, one of which uh, Northern Vigilance had pulled uh, a significant number of North American fighter aircraft uh, into Canada uh, and Western Alaska and, and Northern Alaska in a mock a Cold War hijack exercise. There was another drill, Vigilant Guardian, which was a, uh, a hijack exercise, a command post exercise, but it involved the insertion of false radar blips onto radar screens in the Northeast Air Defense Sector. In addition, we have a confirmation, thanks to General Richard Myers, who was acting chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who, who told Richard Clark, as reported in Clark's book, that there was another exercise, Vigilant Warrior, which was, in fact, according to a NORAD source, a live fly hijack drill being conducted at the same time. With only eight available fighter aircraft, and they have to be dispatched in pairs, they were dealing with as many as 22 possible hijacks on the day of 9-11, and they couldn't separate the war game exercises from the actual hijacks. But this was done deliberately, though. Apparently so, and I will be saying that uh, in my forthcoming book, uh, Crossing the Rubicon, 9-11 and the Decline of American Empire at the End of the Age of Oil. Uh, we have done an extensive investigation on that to show that uh, these uh, war game exercises were apparently very well planned by someone who I will show, I believe, was Dick Cheney in the United States government uh, to deliberately confuse FAA, NORAD, and U.S. Air Force fighter response to fulfill a prophecy that uh, another man had once said, let one happen and stop the rest. On that very point, we have a recording. Hi, Boston Center Team U. We have a, a problem here. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New York. We need someone to scramble some F-16s or something up there to help us out. Is this, is this real world or exercise? No, this is not an exercise manifest. Now, the 9-11 Commission didn't mention the war games, is that right? No, in their final report, they did mention, I think, in one paragraph, Vigilant Guardian. Uh, but the response given by uh, NORAD Commanding General Ralph Eberhardt and other Air Force spokespeople was absolutely nonsensical and had made no uh, mention of any of the other war game exercises. Eberhardt's position was, in fact, which is a, a very ludicrous position, uh, that the uh, Vigilant Guardian exercise, leaving aside the others, uh, actually helped speed response on 9-11, and that is absolutely not the case. How does this relate to the 9-11 Commission report, which says that planes had gone in the wrong directions? Well, that's a separate issue. At, that remains to be clarified. But what I will be uh, uh, disclosing in my book, in, in effect, is that there were two simultaneously operating command and, and control systems functioning on the day of 9-11, and at some times they were, they were issuing conflicting orders. 
Uh, we do not have a clear expl explanation for why fighters from uh, uh, Andrews Air Force Base were sent out over the sea first and couldn't turn around because the 9-11 Commission seemed to change all the evidence uh, just arbitrarily right before it issued its final report. So we don't have a clear explanation, but certainly there, all, there, there was this all consistent uh, with a motive that said make sure that the fighters don't get to any place in time to stop the three critical attacks on the World Trade Center uh, and the Pentagon. Uh, I, I uh, have uh, called that in, in my own research an effective stand down. Would, would you th say that would be a correct characterization? Well, it, 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 it is a uh, de facto stand down. That was the intended result. I would uh, really call it uh, an intended paralysis. Uh, with only eight available fighters, and fighters have to be scrambled in pairs, you only had a chance uh, with, for four responses out of what we have confirmed were as many as 22 possible hijacks showing up on radar screens. That is fascinating and uh, damning information. I look forward to your book. What about the motivation for the whole of 9-11? Well, overall, the primary motivation was uh, something we call peak oil, the fact that the world has uh, either passed or is at now its permanent peak of hydrocarbon or oil production and now about to go into a state, a condition of permanent and irrevocable decline in oil production, even as demand is soaring ex exponentially, uh, both in the West and in China and Asia and the developing countries. Uh, this has set off what we at From the Wilderness, and, and certainly in my book we will, will describe as uh, a very bitter sequence of conflicts, as Dick Cheney told us in the war that will not end in our lifetimes, uh, to secure the last remaining oil reserves on the planet. We've seen a lot of other instances where this kind of attack was predicted and stated as a, as a requirement uh, for the American empire to mobilize its military resources. Zbigniew Brzezinski did in his book, The Grand Chessboard, in 1997. The project for a new uh, American century called for a new Pearl Harbor uh, in 1992. So there is, uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence here uh, showing very clearly that uh, this attack was needed. It was planned and it, all of the evidence that has been so diligently compiled has just been absolutely ignored by the Keene Commission. And uh, finally, Michael, I certainly for one accept your motive of peak oil. What about other motives that could be involved? Well, if you are going to, as Zbigniew Brzezinski wrote, he said uh, some kind of direct external threat, an attack like Pearl Harbor, uh, basically he said you have to scare the bejesus out of the American people uh, to get them to support the, quote, imperial mobilization, those were his words, necessary uh, to secure uh, these vital resources in these st strategic geopolitical regions on the planet. Uh, without that, the American people would never have gone for it. And of course, now in uh, late 2004, we are beginning to see that uh, the American people aren't going along with it now either. Michael, thank you for this today. Bye-bye, Barry. Dr. Robert M. Bowman is a veteran of 122 combat missions in Vietnam. His 22-year Air Force career culminated in his job as Director of Advanced Space Programs Development for the Air Force Space Division during the presidency of Ronald Reagan. He's president of the Institute for Space and Security Studies. His presentation to the Citizens' Inquiry was titled, A Fighter Pilot Looks Back at 9-11 and Forward to a Resurrected America. 9-11 is related to just about everything else, particularly the war against Iraq. These two things have one aspect very much in common. They are both, in my opinion, treason. The cabal of neoconservatives at PNAC, I think you all know what that is, who planned this war, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Wolfowitz, Libby, Pearl, Jeb Bush, even before W became president, I don't say elected, I say became president, this cabal knew the American people would not stand for a war against Iraq, 
unless there was, as they put it in their own document, a new Pearl Harbor. 9-11 supplied that. In other words, 9-11 was a false flag operation. That's one term to describe an act carried out to make it appear it was done by someone else. Next, the man who's written the book on false flag operations. Webster Tarpley is an historian and journalist based in Washington, D.C. He has studied the dark world of intrigue, peopled by patsies, paid killers known as operators, and moles, government officials who flout their own country's laws. He made two presentations to the International Citizens' Inquiry into 9-11. They are uncompromisingly titled The 9-11 Terror Fraud, A Coup Against Civilization. Now here I would submit is a very important diagram that I commend to your attention, and I want to tarry and look at it for a moment. We are dealing with state-sponsored false flag terrorism. I don't mean state-sponsored in the sense that it has to be sponsored by the entire command structure of the country in question, but that it is carried forward by a private network ensconced and infesting decisive nodal points in the state apparatus of that country. I'll try to show you what I mean. Here we have to distinguish a world of patsies, the people that you hear about. I'll try to show you some of this in detail. The people we can call the dupes, the useful idiots, the fanatics, the police agents, the double agents, the provocateurs, in short, the Oswalds, the fall guys. Lee Harvey Oswald, I'm just a patsy, direct quote. That's one group. The moles. This is the group of government officials, the network of government officials whose loyalty is not to the command structure, the Constitution, or their country in some diffuse sense, but rather their loyalty goes to a private intelligence network, a private clique faction, a group of putschists, if you will, people trying to have a coup d'etat. You also have to distinguish the professional killers. These are the cold-blooded technicians of murder. This is the sort of uh, area where you see retired veterans of the Special Forces, the Delta Force, the CIA Operations Directorate, and so on down the line. The old boys. Um, at the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, the term for this group in Washington was the asteroids. Finally, the, the corporate media. They are the indispensable ingredient, because without them, you can't have anything. You have to have mass propaganda to accredit and spread and pound the official version of the events into the minds of people, and to smooth over the inevitable absurdities, contradictions, impossibilities, and so forth of the official story. Mass brainwashing in the Anglo-American tradition is what they propose. You're watching The Great Conspiracy, the 9-11 news special you never saw. When we come back, the classic question. What did the president know about 9-11, and when did he know it? When a competent observer looks for signs of despotism in a community, he looks beyond fine words and noble phrases. One nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome back to The Great Conspiracy, the 9-11 news special you never saw. What did George Bush know about the events of 9-11, and when did he know them? I'm not asking what George Bush, or Bill Clinton for that matter, knows or should have known in the weeks or years before based on this or that so-called intelligence report that he sees or should have seen about vague or not so vague alleged terrorist threats. No, my questions are much more restricted. I'm asking what specific advance information George W. Bush has about the first plane hitting the World Trade Center before it strikes. How does he get that information and from whom? Why does he act as if he has far less information than the record shows he must have had? Initial news reports show the president informed of the gravity of the situation that morning. 
That famous whisper in the ear must be put into context. It takes place at 9.05. That's one hour and five minutes after the first hijacking. 45 minutes after the FAA is aware of multiple errant airliners. 20 minutes after the first aircraft smashes into the Trade Center. 18 minutes after CNN breaks into regular programming. In other words, a torrent of hot water churns under the bridge before whisper time. Researchers Jared Israel and Ilarion Baikov of EmperorsClothes.com write shortly after 9-11. The President of the United States travels with an entire staff, including the Secret Service, which is responsible for his safety. The members of this support team have the best communications equipment in the world. They maintain contact with, or can easily reach, Bush's cabinet, the National Military Command Center in the Pentagon, the FAA. Information concerning these alarming events must be shared with the president by his staff, otherwise they would be derelict in their duties. Not surprising then, this report by ABC's John Cochran, traveling with the president, here speaking to Peter Jennings, not long after the president left his hotel. Peter, as you know, the president is down in Florida talking about education. He got out of his hotel suite this morning, was about to leave. Reporters saw the White House Chief of Staff, Andy Card, whisper into his ear. The reporter said to the president, do you know what's going on in New York? He said he did, and he said he will have something about it later. His first event is in about half an hour at an elementary school in Sarasota, Florida. Something is very odd about the president's behavior. The president is aware, by his own words, that something serious is happening in New York. He additionally has to be aware of a great deal more about the situation. You have John Ashcroft later in the day at a press conference. Immediately after the first report of a plane crashing into the World Trade Towers, numerous federal agencies coordinating with the White House mobilized their resources. You have Vice President Dick Cheney, September 16th on NBC's Meet the Press. He tells host Tim Russert, the Secret Service has an arrangement with the FAA. They had open lines after the World Trade Center was... Then he stops himself. You have Laura Brown of the FAA. She attends hearings of the 9-11 Commission that bear on the aviation aspects of the day. Embarrassed by previous non-forthcoming testimony about the FAA's role, she sends an email in May of 2003 to members of the media whose business cards she had collected. Within minutes after the first aircraft hit the World Trade Center, she states in her email, the FAA immediately established several phone bridges that included FAA field facilities, the FAA command center, FAA headquarters, DOD, the Secret Service, and other government agencies. The U.S. Air Force liaison to the FAA immediately joined the FAA headquarters phone bridge and established contact with NORAD on a separate line. The FAA shared real-time information on the phone bridges about the unfolding events, including information about loss of communication with aircraft, loss of transponder signals, unauthorized changes in course, and other actions being taken by all the flights of interest, including Flight 77. So, in light of all this, here's the odd thing about George Bush's behavior. He and his staff could cancel or postpone an easily postponable photo op but they don't. Why? On 9-11, Bush acts, and I emphasize acts, as if he doesn't know, as if he's not in touch. He proceeds with, or feigns, normality. Now to something else that's puzzling. At a town hall session in Orlando, Florida, on December the 4th, 2001, here's the president's own account of the early morning of 9-11. How did you feel when you heard about the terrorist attack? Well, thank you, Jordan. Well, Jordan, you're not going to believe where, what state I was in when I heard about the terrorist attack. <laughs> I was in Florida. And uh, my chief of staff, Andy Card, well, actually, I was in a classroom talking about a reading program that works. And uh, it, uh, I had, was sitting outside uh, the, the, the classroom waiting to go in, and I saw an airplane hit the tower, 
of a, of a TV, you know, the TV was obviously on. The president tells us he sees on an ordinary TV set outside a school classroom, the first plane hit the World Trade Center. He gives the oddly reinforcing detail that, quote, the TV was obviously on, unquote. He continues. I used to fly myself, and I said, well, there's one terrible pilot. And uh, I said, it must have been a, a horrible accident. But I was whisked off there. I didn't have much time to think about it. Didn't have time to think about it. As if his being told, time to meet the kids, Mr. President, stops all his thought processes concerning the remarkable image of what he's told us he's just seen on an ordinary TV, on top of all his knowledge of the unprecedented situation from earlier in the morning. But anyway, could George Bush have seen on ordinary TV the first plane hit the World Trade Center? No, he could not have. The footage of that first strike only shows up on television the next day, September the 12th, 2001. It was taken by a French documentary crew that happened to be in downtown New York. Oh, shit. The Orlando Town Hall session takes place seven weeks after 9-11, so it can be suggested Bush confuses the second plane with the first. But how to explain this? We've all seen Andy Carr do that. None of this can ever be retracted. It is an interlocking historical record. Why go on at length about this? Because it may one day become the basis for criminal court proceedings. When we come back, is George Bush one of a group of conspirators involved with the attack? Welcome back to The Great Conspiracy, the 9-11 news special you never saw. George Bush is very convincing that he saw the first plane strike the World Trade Center the morning of 9-11 on regular TV. He provides supporting details, has repeated the story, and never retracted it. It has run on the White House website. Since he cannot have seen it on regular TV as he claims, it is not unreasonable to conclude that he sees the first plane on private closed circuit TV earlier that morning or in a private holding room later. Either way, I submit this could mean that someone had to arrange for cameras to be positioned and rolling to record the first plane strike. Those involved had to know precisely that the first plane was in the air, where and when the plane would hit. In other words, people closely associated with the President of the United States had very specific prior knowledge of the existence of the first plane, its destination, and its purpose. More clues. Bush's itinerary is well known. There are plenty of live news media reports concerning the President's whereabouts from the time he gets up that morning in his hotel until the time he arrives at Booker Elementary School and how long it will take him to get there. Remember ABC's John Cochran and the half hour? Yet, the Secret Service, for at least a full half hour after he is notified that America is under attack, takes no steps to remove the president to safety. What happens instead? This footage also appears in Michael Moore's film Fahrenheit 9-11. No one claims this footage is doctored. The president continues reading a story about a pet goat for at least seven minutes. One columnist absurdly suggests that the president doesn't want to alarm the children. But could the president not have said, Kids, I'm sorry, I have to excuse myself. There's some important business I have to attend to. You just carry on with your reading, you hear? Any reasonable analysis suggests that the president and his handlers share sufficient real-time and prior knowledge of the unprecedented events of that day. The public record shows the president and his associates fail to act appropriately. That they in fact create a fiction and play act their assigned roles. This evidence alone constitutes grounds for proceeding with an indictment on charges of conspiracy to commit treason. But if, let's be dogged here, if the official story is true, and an astoundingly successful sneak attack from diabolical Muslims caught America totally off guard, then 
the White House surely must be highly motivated to turn heaven and earth, to use one of their own favorite cliches, to investigate the events of that day as quickly and thoroughly as possible. The White House must rush to appoint a respected chairman and commissioners, give them the widest powers to call witnesses, spare no expense. Except for the Reichstag fire, that's how it's usually done. Six days after the sinking of the Titanic, a chairman is appointed to head an investigation. Nine days after Pearl Harbor, the first of four investigative commissions is struck. The JFK assassination, the Challenger disaster, seven days each. How many days after 9-11 is it that President Bush names someone to head an investigation? This commission has been charged with a crucial task. Call it foot dragging. And then, who does Bush appoint? He appoints Henry Kissinger. Naming Kissinger sets a new standard for cynicism, or for being out of touch, or both. A New York Times editorial suggests the choice was to contain an investigation the White House long opposed. But Kissinger at least is an expert on the date September 11th. It was on that day in 1973 that the CIA-assisted overthrow of the democratically elected government of Chile takes place, masterminded by Kissinger for Richard Nixon. President Salvador Allende is murdered. In his 2001 book, The Trial of Henry Kissinger, Christopher Hitchens notes Kissinger as a crucial figure at all stages of this crime and cover-up. Now, this is in reference to a bloody and unnecessary Kissinger-driven episode in Indochina, which cost the lives of 64 U.S. servicemen. But it also sums up Kissinger's role in the bloody Chilean operation. The cover-up is as important as the crime. The White House tries to install Kissinger, an expert at cover-ups, to head the 9-11 investigation. After a universal backlash, Kissinger backs off. Bush then names, it's 431 days now, Thomas Kane and Lee Hamilton as co-chairman. Kane's Azerbaijan oil connections and other conflicts of interest should make him ineligible from the outset. He earlier co-chairs the Homeland Security Project. Observers have noted that huge profits are to be made in the surveillance and security industries these days. The more alarmed the public, the bigger the profits. As for co-chair Lee Hamilton, Washington investigative journalist Joyce Lynn says he should be called Mr. Cover-Up. He is zero for four, she says, in finding any malfeasance in the four previous investigative commissions on which he served. These include the Iran-Contra affair and the October surprise, which denied Jimmy Carter the presidency. The White House chooses all the commissioners. Lynn calls them key insiders rife with conflicts of interest. The White House brazenly appoints as the executive director one Dr. Philip Zelikow, a right-wing Republican hawk deeply involved in the Bush circle, a member of the Bush-Cheney transition team, and a National Security Council advisor with Condoleezza Rice under Bush 1. The editor of Vanity Fair, Graydon Carter, sums it up. The Bush White House did everything in its power to derail an open inquiry. Then, when faced with its inevitability, the president and his aides sought to limit its scope, its access, and its funding. The commission's full title is the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks Upon the United States. Reflecting extreme laziness in research and wording, the mainstream media keep referring to it as the Independent 9-11 Commission. This commission was about as independent from White House control and manipulation as the abused prisoners at Abu Ghraib were from their jailers. Mandate. The commission itself says, we're not out to blame anyone. In other words, accountability is not part of the mandate. Budget? In January 2003, the Bush administration allots the commission $3 million. This compares to $5 million for a 1996 commission that looked into casino gambling, and $50 million each for the inquiries into the Columbia shuttle explosion and the Clinton's failed Whitewater deal. The dollar amount is later grudgingly raised but never exceeds $15 million. The White House releases only 25% of 11,000 documents requested. It blacks out portions of the released documents, resists requests that the administration officials testify under oath, and tries to rush the commission's deadline. 
After a cat and mouse game, Bush and Cheney meet the commission. But it is behind closed doors. They refuse to testify under oath. No tape recorders are allowed. No transcript is allowed. Bush makes no opening statement, and those taking notes must submit them to security personnel. All of this is what is called in law guilty demeanor. The behavior of the White House in relation to the commission from start to finish only makes sense if the official story is a lie and the truth needs to be kept secret. The term whitewash doesn't do justice to the report of the 9-11 Commission. Omission-riddled inventive cover-up, maybe? The Commission finds that the ultimate reason the events of 9-11 took place was a failure of imagination. They ought to know. Imagination was something the Commission had in abundance. The Commission imagines U.S. intelligence received insufficient specific warnings of an impending event. Even though CIA head George Tenet says in an unguarded moment that the system was blinking red, the commission imagines there's nothing to go with. When we return, an American researcher on the number of published warnings. A community rates low on an information scale when the press, radio, and other channels of communication are controlled by only a few people. And if books, and newspapers and the radio are efficiently controlled, the people will read and accept exactly what the few in control want them to. Welcome back to The Great Conspiracy, the 9-11 news special you never saw. American Paul Thompson has created the definitive timeline of events related to 9-11. It's drawn exclusively from published reports. Thompson takes almost an hour at the Toronto Citizens Inquiry to list a fraction of the published reports dealing with early warnings. Then in late August, so according to some news reports uh, from Der Spiegel and uh, Die Zeit, and uh, it's also re reported in the BBC and Haaretz in Israel, this is really interesting. Uh, supposedly, Israel gives the U.S. a list of 19 terrorist names. So there are 19 people on the flight, and here they're giving 19 names. We don't know if they're the exact same list. But we do know, according to these reports, that four of the names are the same, including Nawaf al-Hazmi, Khalid al-Midar, Marwan al-Shihi, and Mohammed Atta. So these are like the big leaders of the 9-11 attack, and here Israel is saying that these people are inside the United States and planning a, an imminent attack. Um, then uh, early September, uh, Egypt warns the U.S. saying that Al-Qaeda is in the advanced stages of a, quote, significant operation, unquote, against an American target, probably within the U.S. So, you know, as, just as an aside, remember that virtually every one of these things I've been talking about is talking about an attack inside the U.S. Remember that George Tenet said that all the information they had pointed to an attack overseas. In the context of this program, it's important to note these warnings are from individuals, agencies, and whole governments who are obviously not in on the plot. It should be observed that in the main, the controversies over who knew what and when about the attacks are diversionary mini-dramas that reinforce the official fiction. What these individuals and agencies and governments discover are plans and patsies being prepared to play their roles. Even if it's the, the most charitable explanation and we say it was only incompetence, that that incompetence was so severe. I mean, how many warnings do you need? Uh, in, and not only that, but it was followed after 9-11 by a cover-up, and as it's often said, it's not the crime, but it's the cover-up that you know that you end up going to jail for. That you know between the incompetence and the cover-up, that that alone should lead to impeachment of President Bush and and all of his top people. Speaking of Bush and his top people, the commission imagines, page 35, that at 8:46, when Flight 11 hits the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Neither the president or anyone, quote, in the White House or traveling with the president knew that Flight 11 had been hijacked at 8.14 that morning. Wrong. 
The commission imagines, page 39, that as late as 9.30, quote, no one in the president's traveling party had any information that other aircraft were hijacked or missing. Wrong. The commission imagines it can get away with such claims, even though millions of people saw TV news reports about the hijackings on CNN beginning at 8.48. The 9-11 Commission fails to ask many, many questions. Why, for instance, was protective cover not provided for Air Force One? The Commission makes no mention of the extensive connections between the Bush and Bin Laden families. The Commission imagines, and it's utterly right, that the media will fail spectacularly in their duty to notice these and other glaring omissions. The Commission counts on the media failing to be skeptical or to ask probing questions. As columnist Lawrence Martin puts it, you would think that given the presidential record of duplicity, Bill Clinton on Monica, Ronald Reagan on Iran-Contra, Richard Nixon on Watergate, Lyndon Johnson on the Gulf of Tonkin, John Kennedy on the Missile Gap, that journalists might catch on one day, not in America. Martin adds, if media buttons weren't so easy to push, it's a safe bet that the terrorism threat wouldn't get half the airtime. Well, half the airtime would still be billions of hours. The Commission imagines, and it's right again, that the New York Times will devote pages and pages of coverage to the Commission's report without batting an eye at the shortcomings dealt with in this program. Subsequently, scores of New York Times stories quote the findings of the 9-11 Commission as dependable truth on anything to do with 9-11. The Commission imagines, and it's right on the money, that TV networks will air without question and newspapers publish without question. This alleged exchange on 9-11 between the FAA's Herndon Command Center and FAA headquarters. I call it the uh report. Uh, do we want to think about uh, scrambling aircraft? Oh, God, I don't know. Uh, that's a decision somebody's going to have to make probably in the next 10 minutes. Can we hold it right there? Imagine anyone, say yourself, learning of a major emergency. A neighbor calls to tell you your house is on fire. And you say, yeah, somebody's going to have to make a decision about that in probably 10 minutes. The fact is that on the morning of 9-11, there's a good chance that you leaped into action. Millions of ordinary people did. They call family and friends to turn on the TV. Many, I was one, try to get through to loved ones in New York. We find the phone system down. We call others to see if they'd gotten through. And they call us. But... At FAA headquarters? Uh, you know, everybody just left the room. Yes, sir. I've noticed that. When there's a really big emergency, such as we have with the uh report here, key people just walk out of the room with fishing rods. When we come back, comments about the FAA and the 9-11 Commission report from David Ray Griffin, author of the book The New Pearl Harbor, disturbing questions about the Bush administration and 9-11. Welcome back. David Ray Griffin's book, The New Pearl Harbor, is widely admired as the definitive critique of the official story of 9-11. Griffin has gone on to draft a critique of the report of the 9-11 Commission. Griffin concludes that the Commission sets up the FAA as the fall guy to protect the U.S. military and thereby the Bush administration. In one case, the Commission claims officials at FAA headquarters had to debate whether the report of a hijacked airliner with a bomb aboard was enough to justify bothering the military. The Commission, says Griffin, portrays most FAA personnel as hopeless bunglers. In fact, in Griffin's words, guilty of criminal negligence of the most extreme sort. Yet, this is the same commission that says it cannot find any particular people deserving of blame. A remarkable contradiction. Another one. The commission itself points out the FAA did have one truly unprecedented task to perform that day. Namely, immediately landing thousands of aircraft in the air wherever they were. The Commission agrees the FAA, and I quote, executed that unprecedented task flawlessly, unquote. 
Is it not strange, asks Griffin, that FAA personnel carried out this unprecedented task flawlessly and yet failed so miserably with tasks they had been performing on a regular basis? Additionally, Griffin observes, according to the Commission, the U.S. military is itself blind, being wholly dependent on the FAA to inform it about what is going on in U.S. airspace. The commissioners would have us forget, as they do, the billions of dollars NORAD spent building detection systems second to none. As Thierry Maysan writes in his book, Pentagate, the military in fact possess several very sophisticated radar monitoring systems incomparable with the civilian systems. The website for one of these systems, called Pave Pause, states it is capable of detecting and monitoring a great number of targets that would be consistent with a massive submarine-launched ballistic missile, or SLBM, attack. Are we to believe, Griffin asks, that our military's radar systems, which could simultaneously track dozens of missiles, could not track a single airliner headed for New York City? Griffin and others list several serious matters in which the 9-11 Commission shows no interest. They include the puzzling nature of the collapse of the Twin Towers. Jet fuel cannot burn hot enough to melt structural steel. Why surface-to-air missiles at the Pentagon were not triggered to protect the building? The question of what hit the Pentagon. The hole in the building was much smaller than a 757 would make. The connections between the Bush and Bin Laden families. And the startling case of World Trade Center Building No. 7. This and other overwhelming evidence ignored or explained away by the 9-11 Commission, which should be called the 9-11 Cover-Up Commission, suggests 9-11 is planned and executed at the highest levels of the U.S. government. People forget what immense powers and resources governments and shadow governments have to organize covert operations, fabricate false evidence, destroy real evidence, issue misleading statements, organize cover-ups, and generally make things happen through deploying agents, career inducements, bribery, and threats, subtle or otherwise. Governments have the powers to kill, maim, and imprison, and they use them. One example, it's the endless arrests of suspected terrorists, the vast majority eventually released without any charges being laid. On any other subject, this would create a huge outcry. And of course, governments have the powers of propaganda, PR spin, news management, and not least, secrecy. In the face, though, even of this overwhelming evidence, people still find reasons to remain blind to the possibility that 9-11 was an inside job. They say a conspiracy this large could not be kept secret. But most large covert operations are kept secret. People say they, meaning the Bush administration, wouldn't dare for fear they'd be found out. As for being found out by the media, well, what's to fear so far? Upholding the U.S. Constitution obligates one to guard against enemies, foreign and domestic. The founders of the country included that for good reason. They knew that for centuries governments have turned toxic. The price of freedom is eternal vigilance, and not just from outside threats. The trumpeting of outside threats, in fact, is the commonest ploy used by internal rogues. Today's media feast on, profit from, and join in the trumpeting of outside threats and the demonization of designated villains. We expect more of the media than we've been getting. We expect them to remember something of history to be watchdogs for democracy, and to have some backbone. Won't just one major paper do what the Washington Post did with Watergate? Get onto this and not let go until the rest of the media have to pay attention? I've been a media critic for 35 years. I've watched the media become more and more corporate, more and more ideological, more and more dishonest, more and more part of a power structure which manufactures and manipulates fear and excuses death and destruction, and thereby become complicit in it. But I've also learned a big lesson, belatedly, and that is that too many of us want to be shielded from troublesome truth, want our inner child to be reassured, want, in short, 
to be lied to. With knowledge comes responsibility. We who are finding the scales falling from our eyes must also find the courage to make our media and government accountable. Many peaceful means for doing this still exist. This is Barry Zwicker, signing off for The Great Conspiracy, the 9-11 news special you never saw, but that I still live in hopes that you will. <laughs>